All right, if you have your Bible with you, please go ahead and turn over to Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1, that's where we will be. Two years ago, um, myself and my wife's side of the family went down to Disney World for Christmas. Um, and, the, and thankfully, uh, we ended up getting into Magic Kingdom on Christmas Day. I think that was your mom's idea for some crazy reason. Oh, that's recording. No, edit that. Just kidding. Um, but the day uh, on, on Christmas Eve, we ended up going to what's known as uh, the Animal Kingdom and saw a lot of very imposing animals. I have a new affinity for the silverback gorilla. Um, but as you, uh, from what I can remember, as you enter into the animal kingdom, um, there is one of the, the, the symbol for that or the thing that draws your attention to kind of capture your awe uh, for what you're about to experience is probably the biggest fake tree I've ever seen in my life. Uh, and it looks so real. Like when I first saw it, I was like, man, that, that's, that's got to be the Guinness Book of World's Record for the largest tree in Orlando. Because Orlando doesn't have a lot of big trees. And so from afar off, it looked real. But once you got close to it, you kind of got the picture and you kind of understood, okay, that's not a real tree, that's fake. And so from understanding that it was a fake tree, you can understand that there actually were no roots. That while from afar off, it looked like those roots were deep, that those roots were strong, and that those roots could hold in a storm. Once you got up close to it, you could understand that, man, if there's a strong enough hurricane that comes through here, that tree is in trouble because it really has no roots. And you know, in the same way, we can kind of be like that tree at Disney World, if we're not careful. That from afar off, what people see might be something that looks like it's firm, looks like it's planted, looks like it's solid, looks like it is in line with what Jesus wants it to be in line with, wants us to be in line with. But what happens when they actually examine our lives. What happens if someone gets close enough to you to where they actually can see your roots, where they can actually see what's growing in your life? The outflow of the heart is represented by the actions of your life. And so one of the things that we have to do as Christians is we have to make sure that our roots are firm, that our roots are are solid because whether you know it or not, whether you think about it or not, whether you meditate it or not, on, on it or not, at some point in your life and at some point in my life, there's going to come a storm or two or three or four. And if the roots aren't firm and if the roots aren't solid, the world and life will blow you and me away. It'll destroy our faith. I mean, think about it for a second. How many people do you personally know who claimed Christianity and then when life kicked him in the gut, they abandoned it? And they don't want it. If God is A, B, C, or D, then why did this happen? I propose that part of the reason that that takes place is because of weak roots. And so... Psalm 1 is foundational and Psalm 1 is key for you and me because what the psalmist is going to do is he's going to set the tone for the entire book. Psalm 1 is the outline for the entire book of Psalms. And what the psalmist is going to do for us this evening is he's going to give us this message. The righteous have strong roots and the wicked have weak ones. 
The righteous have strong roots and the wicked have weak ones. And so it's up to us as the Bible students to figure out why is that? Why is it that the righteous have the strong roots and the wicked have the weak roots? Well, he notes in verse 1, blessed is the man or blessed is the person. This word blessed literally means approved by God. Approved by God. Isn't that something that all of us day in and day out, if we want firm, strong roots, if we want to be that righteous person that has strong roots, we should seek the approval of God and not the approval of the people that are surrounding us. And that is so hard because there's so many things in our life that are interlocked with the approval of people. And we have a society that lives to meet the needs and to meet the desires and to meet the popularity and to meet the right polling numbers of people. And I know it's an easy jab to take a stab at politicians. I get that. But how many of them switch a position because the polling changes? And what, does, and what do they get hammered for? They get hammered for not because the polling changes, but because they switch their position on the basis of what people think. That they're not consistent. And I would rather be, and hopefully this, this evening, I, I hope you're in the same stream of thought with me, that I would rather be blessed and approved by God if that means some suffering at the hands of people. If that means some people won't accept me for who I am. I'm okay with that because I'm blessed by God. And he says, blessed is the man, approved is the man who walks how? And he gives a negative term, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands with the sinner, nor sits at the seat of the scoffer. See, here's one of the keys to being, or that differentiates the righteous person from the wicked person. It's not that the righteous person doesn't have anything to do with wicked people because we see in the Gospels, we even see in the Old Testament that the prophets and the servants of God were around evil people everywhere they went. Sometimes it was their own Jewish brothers that were wicked. So the text isn't saying don't engage wicked people. What the text is saying is don't allow wicked people to sow something in your heart that's not godly. That's the meaning of the text. And so what does that mean? What does that look like practical application wise? And I'm going to take a different route this evening. Because it's, it, once again, it would just be too easy for me to sit here and list off the five major sins that everybody is not supposed to do. We all kind of know what those are. But maybe even down more to a finite or, or, or uh, condensed application and I'm preaching to myself here too. How many times do you find yourself in a Facebook debate online? How many times do you find yourself on a Facebook debate online? How many times, if you have a Twitter account, do you retweet something just to get at somebody else? How many times do you find yourself sitting with people who see things you are bad-mouthing the other side of a specific issue or policy change in the workspace? How often, when other people ridicule people who don't look like you, walk like you, talk like you, how often do you join in on that? Because after all, that's what kind of everybody's doing, and that'll just give everybody a nice, cheap laugh at the expense of people who actually need the gospel. But we would rather define them by what they're not than by what they can be. See, all of those are still classified as wicked. All of those would still be classified as sin. And all of those would still be classified as sitting at the seat of the scoffer. See, when we do that, even on the smallest level, 
We're opening the door for something unrighteous to be sown in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives. Another question, and I know that with my generation, it, this would probably be really unpopular, but what kind of music you listen to? What kind of shows do we watch? What movies do we find ourselves looking at? How often do we ourselves encourage things like, well, it's just a little white lie. How often do we ourselves take part in being the scoffer? And see, the thing about the wicked and the thing about the sinner and the thing about the scoffer is they can't see the forest through the trees. They don't really view themselves as the sinner, as the scoffer, as the wicked. That's everybody else on the other side. That's the dividing wall that they place. And so in thinking that they are righteous, they are actually the ones who are the unrighteous. And see, here's the difference between the wicked, the sinner, the scoffer, and the one who's righteous. It's seen in verse two. It's the man who doesn't do all those things, but rather delights in the law of the Lord. Even if the sinner, the scoffer, and the wicked mock him for being delighted in the law of the Lord, he still delights in it. He still finds refuge there. He still finds solace there. He still finds uh, the opportunity to commune with God more important than what those other three classifications of people think, say, or do. And notice how long the righteous man dwells and meditates on the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. See, if you want <clears throat> firm roots, strong roots, the law of the Lord, the text of scripture, is something that should be a priority day in and day out. There's a consistency there with the righteous man. And because the righteous man is consistent in meditating and studying on the law of the Lord, he is easy, he is, easy, he is able to discern what situations and circumstances he should uh, follow through with and what circumstances and situations he shouldn't even be a part of, he shouldn't even associate with. Because he understands that while he meditates and while he looks, <coughs> at the law of the Lord day and night, what he can gather from scripture is that there are these things in the world that are absolutely positively unhealthy for him to partake in. See, here's the thing. Most of you know this about me. I like golf. Right, but people are still licking their wounds, so I won't do that. I like golf. But it doesn't define me. It used to. But it doesn't define me. It's not something that I obsess over day in and day out. It's not something that I spend the majority of my time thinking that, hey, at some point I'm going to take this and I'm going to go ahead and go play you know, golf on the PGA Tour. That's not me. See, there's a difference between liking something and then being obsessed with something. See, there's a difference between liking Jesus and loving and being obsessed with him. There's a difference between liking the text of scripture and being compelled by it. Diving into it and pulling from it the mind and the will of God. See, God's word isn't just the dessert at the end of the meal. It's the full course of the Christian life. 
And one of the reasons that we see, at least in culture, one of the reasons why the church is in decline in the culture certainly is because there are a whole lot of people who would classify, who we would classify as sinners and scoffers and wicked, and certainly they are playing an impact on moving people away from a relationship with God. But the other piece of the equation is that maybe God's people want the word of God as the dessert and not the full course meal. Maybe too often, we just kind of like Jesus. You know what I do with people that I like? I let them in every once in a while. But I keep them kind of at an arm's distance. And most of us do that. It was called call associates, Right? They're not necessarily friends, they're not family, they're associates. You know, when we get together and we talk, you know, it's, it's very brief. And the conversation usually isn't that deep. And I don't necessarily dislike their presence, it's just that I don't see them a lot. And I don't really have a sway either way. I don't really care whether I see them a lot. Just as long as the conversation is very superficial... And nothing crazy happens, we're all right. See, if we delight in the law of God, if we delight in a relationship with Jesus, he can't be at arm's length. He can't just be the person that comes around a couple of times a week that we have a conversation with and hope that it doesn't get too deep and that it stays superficial. Because here's the thing, a superficial Christianity, a surface Christianity, a surface relationship can't stand the storm because there are no roots. Jesus said, build your house upon the rock, not sand. And so it's the psalmist here who says, the one who is righteous, the one who has the firm roots is the one who delights in the law of the Lord and he does it with a consistency. Because then in being consistent by watering his soul, those roots can grow stronger and the person can grow. And in fact, that's exactly what the psalmist says. If you're the righteous person, you have the strong roots, then guess what? You're like a tree that's planted so it seems that there's some intention here in verse 3 that the tree is specifically planted at a specific place at a specific time for a specific purpose. James said that we're to receive the word implanted, not at arm's length. Because James understands and James knows this psalm. He is like a tree planted by stream, streams of water that yields its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. Why? Why is it that the tree that's planted by the stream of water does this? Why does it reap such good things? Because it's by the source of strength. It's by the source that gives it its nutrition that allows it to grow to its maximum potential. And if you want a, a righteous faith, if you want a faith that's got some firm roots, then you've got to be near the source. And I don't say this lightly, it legitimately boggles my mind. Over the years that, that I've been doing this, that some people, and you've experienced this, there are some people who you know have been struggling with their faith, haven't been near the source, they haven't been planted by the, the, the stream of water, the, the spring of life, that when it wells up, it brings about eternal life, and they struggle with their faith and they're distant from Jesus, and they don't know what's going on, and they come and they say, I don't know why I'm not growing. you near the source. See, it's hard to drink water when you're in a desert. It's easy to thrive 
in an oasis. And too many people want the water that Jesus offers, but want to live in a spiritual desert. And it can't happen. And so their roots are weak. And notice what it says in verse three. It says there that in all he does, he prospers. You mean I'm gonna make a million dollars if I just follow Jesus? Not a chance necessarily. What is he talking about there if that's not what he's talking about? See, he's not talking about the physical things. He says he will prosper in the spiritual things. Why? Because he's never gonna face persecution? No. Because he's never gonna face the scoffer? No. Because he's never gonna uh, get ridiculed by the sinner? No. But because he's faithful. And because the one who causes him to prosper is not the one who mocks him. It's not the one who makes fun of him. It's not the sinner. It's not the wicked. It's God Almighty. And notice the contrast between the first three verses and the last three verses. The first three verses talk about the person who's righteous, the person who has those strong roots. And the last three or about the person who's weak, weak roots of the wicked person. See, the wicked are not so. They're not strong. The wicked are the ones who don't delight in the law of the Lord. The wicked are the ones who are planted, not by the stream of water, but they are in the desert. Their leaf is the one that does wither. They are the one who spiritually, they don't prosper. But they are like chaff that the wind drives away. You see the difference between the chaff and the tree? See, it doesn't matter how hard the wind blows against the tree. It's not moving because it's planted, because it's firm, because it is like a rock. It won't go anywhere. But the wicked who have withered up, driven away by the smallest of winds. And so where the tree will ultimately stand during the storms of life, it's the wicked who will fall. And in verse five, it says, therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. The way of the wicked will perish. That's a sobering thought. And as we live in a society that moves or is in a post-Christian society, It is imperative that God's people have strong roots. Because as we see in multiple texts in scripture that there is the possibility for the person who is at one point righteous to be swayed by the world and shipwreck, as Paul would say in 1 Timothy chapter 1, shipwreck their faith as Alexander the coppersmith did. He's talked negatively in chapter in, in uh, First Timothy, and he's also talked negatively again in Second Timothy. He has shipwrecked his faith because of the desires and the temptations of the world. But there's also the other aspect of it that Paul talks about in multiple areas in the New Testament. Not just the person who shipwrecks their faith by indulging in the debauchery of the society they live in, but it's also the person who stands idle and does nothing to stop it. And this is why the definition of love 
in both the Gospels and the New Testament is a self-sacrificial love, which means I will do what is in the best interest of the other person no matter what it may cost me. For there's no greater love than this that a man lay his life down for his friend. That's what Jesus said. And so the person who stands by idly and allows brothers and sisters friends and neighbors to simply walk off into the darkness without seeking to save them from the eternal judgment that's talked about here in Psalm chapter 1 verses 5 and 6 is also the person who can be classified as wicked and also the person who can't stand before those other people and say, I love you. For if I love you and I know that you're doing wrong, it demands that I say something to you out of that love. See, oftentimes we paint a picture that Jesus hated the Pharisees. No, he didn't. He loved them to the nth degree that he died for them. And so the question that we have to ask this evening is, what do our roots look like? And, the, and it goes back to the basic disciplines of Christianity. And for most of us, we've heard of, and most of us, uh, so or some of us, maybe when we hear it, we say, oh, well, that's cliche. Oh, well, we talk about that all the time. And you know, well, all the, you know, that's all the preacher talks about. Maybe sometimes we have to revisit those spiritual disciplines because we've lacked them. So I'm just going to ask the question and you can answer it. What's your prayer life with your family look like? Notice that didn't say your individual prayer life. What's your prayer life with your family look like? What about your family devotional time and your personal devotional time? What about your study habits? What about the times in which you meditate on the word of God? See, those things are what plants people by the stream of the water of eternal life. And that's the difference between the righteous strong roots and the wicked weak roots. And I don't know when, and I don't know how, and I don't know what circumstance or situation it'll be. But at some point, everybody in this room is gonna face a punch in the gut from life. And the question is, what are people gonna see when they get right up close and look because it's so easy to look like a Christian from afar off and like that tree at Disney World so easy to think man that's the real thing from afar off but one thing I hope never happens to you and never happens to me is that people who genuinely want to know what the righteousness of Jesus Christ looks like. What I don't want to happen is that they, from afar off, see a group of people who maybe speak the language and, you know, dress the dress and they talk the talk, but when they actually get there and examine up close, they say, ah, no roots. Fake. What I want for your life and what I want for my life is those firm, strong roots that makes a difference. Not just to the people that we know and that we love on Wednesday and Sunday. But for the single mom out in the community that can't make ends meet, that needs help. For the kid who's been abandoned by friends, by family, at school. And it's us, through our kids, 
who, pull that, who pulls that person in under the wing and helps them grow. But in order to do that, roots have to be firm. So tonight the question is, your roots, are they firm or are they weak? And if they're weak, the first place that we can start is by getting back to those basic spiritual disciplines. And this is a time, once again, as a family, as a group of uh, sinners who have found the Savior, to take this time and maybe say, you know what? I've been pretty weak. I need some help. I need your prayers. I need somebody to, to study with. I need somebody to, you know, have that fellowship with on a consistent basis. If that's you, don't wait. Let's do that this evening as we stand and as we sing.